Face-to-face -face communication is one of the most valuable tools we have as far as bridging disagreement and just understanding each other as human beings. Matt, welcome to POVs. Thank you so much for having me. It's so nice seeing you face to face. We've done an Instagram Live together, we did a panel together, and now you're here on the couch. I know, I feel like most people never see me face to face. I'm like a recluse just in my apartment, like typing away. It's nice so to I be in person. Mode of communication. Absolutely, it's an honor to have you here. And Matt, every episode here on POVs, we dive in right off the top with a pretty spicy question. So you ready to dive in? As long as it's not top or bottom. It is not top or bottom <laughs> <laughs> yet. <laughs> Just kidding. Okay. Um, okay, Matt, my question for you, is it ever worth engaging with someone who has hate towards your identity? From the perspective of a queer person, I would never like implore someone to go out and find the homophobes and the transphobes and be like, fix them. You know, I think you spend so much time as a queer person trying to figure out yourself and find peace with who you are that to like, to go out and find the most hateful people who cause you the most pain, change them or fix them or convince them out of their hate is not really something that I think is fair to ask of people. You're not born with hate, we know this. Hate comes from a place of fear. It can come from a place of feeling threatened. Protecting your well-being and your peace of mind is so important, but there's always something to learn. And there's a lot to dive in there. But Matt, that's why I wanted to have you on the show. I watch all of the content you post and the conversations you're starting online, and you're someone who constantly is receiving dissent for what you do. And what? You're... <laughs> and you're someone who invites in that conversation where I think a lot of people nowadays are unwilling mm. to cross that bridge. So mm. I'm curious to start understanding where that point of view comes from. Do you remember the first time you ever encountered some sort of hate even around your own identity? I was called a faggot before I knew what what faggot meant or what gay meant. And like, I remember when I was 15, I was with my friends. You know, I grew up in like a suburb and we were just uh, hanging outside, like walking the street and this uh, car drove past. Someone like rolled down the window and yelled faggot and then they drove off. Interestingly, as I got older, I learned that like being called a faggot out of a moving vehicle is actually an experience that a lot of young gay kids have. Honestly, like most queer people, I think I carry those feelings from childhood with me always. Do you feel like you discovered who you were through the lens of some of those hateful experiences? When did you realize that you were gay? I knew I was gay when I was like 10. I just had this moment where like the word gay had seeped into my brain. And I had a moment where again, I was like, oh, I'm attracted to a man. Wait, I'm gay. From that point, I spent years trying to bury that down as far as possible. Realizing that I was gay was inevitable, but then the way that I felt about that as a child before I came out and the way that I repressed it, like that was all informed by hate. And it's like, I didn't realize that I was gay and it's like, oh, okay, that's a neutral thing. Like finding out the sky is blue. To you know? what extent does your Jewish identity play a role in this? Did you ever experience hate for being Jewish growing up? No, I think I internalized anti-Semitism growing up. I went to a birthday party once of a friend <laughs> from my class, we were probably like eight. You know, I'm like the little closeted gay kid. I'm gonna be hanging out more with like the mom of the kids than the kids. Sure. Cause they were all boys and I just had, couldn't have anything to do with it. And so, and they were all Christian and this mom, she was like, what are you giving up for Lent? And I was like, in hindsight, I'm like, my last name is Bernstein. Why are you asking me what I'm giving up for Lent? Come on. But at the time I was like, oh my God, this is my chance to like fit in. And so I said, pizza. An hour later, my mom came to pick me up from the birthday party. And this mother who I had been speaking with was like, oh, I heard Matt's giving a pizza for Lent. And my mom looked at me. She was like, no, the fuck you are not. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, that's like, as a kid, you just want to fit in. Whether it's like your sexuality or your religion or like the, the way your hair looks, right? Matt, I relate to that in more ways than you could possibly understand. Thinking about the conversations you were probably having at a young age around your identity, do you remember the first conversation you had with someone who really disagreed with you? One of the early conversations that I had with someone after I came out, or kind of in the midst of my coming out, I was on the track team. This kid on my track team was like, I do not think gay marriage should be legalized. And I was like, 
why? And he said, my dad told me that if we let gay people get married, then all of the financial benefits of marriage are gonna go away for straight people. Do you feel like you had the right words to say and actually have a conversation with him? No, definitely not. I didn't have like the political language nor the argumentation skills to really engage in a way that wasn't just like, oh, you're, you suck, you know? Yeah. But he did suck, so I was right at least a little bit. <laughs> For sure. That's a hard conversation to have, especially before coming out. Yeah, I knew, I knew though in high school, whenever people were like, when it was gay marriage, it was like, well, my parents said, I was like, let's stop it there. Because if all you have on this is your parents said, it's like, you don't know a gay person. Gay and that's person. where a lot of our beliefs come from, right? It's how we're raised, it's what we're told. Yeah. And I think a lot of what you do now in this present moment is help break down some of those preconceived notions. And the way you do it is a lot of times through humor and yes. sarcasm and hypocrisy and pointing out that hypocrisy. How do you weigh for yourself now what conversations to engage in versus the ones that are a no-go? I don't try to spread myself too thin because the truth is like I don't know everything about everything. I would love to talk intelligently about every topic that is of the moment and I get a lot of messages saying like talk about this, talk about that. I only want to contribute where I think my contribution is valuable otherwise I think it's best to just read. I take on the conversations around masculinity, around gender, around conservatism, around things that I feel like I can speak to intelligently or with humor, or just any way that I can reach people, you know, and, and make them think or make them laugh. If I feel like too emotional about the topic, I will not talk about it. Like I said, when it comes to something so emotional and like personal for me, I don't wanna just spew into the void and also so many people are gonna see it. I don't want something to be received the wrong way. I don't ever wanna talk for the sake of talking, for the sake of spilling, filling up space in someone's news feed. Like don't tweet just for the sake of like having your tweet fill up space in the reply section. I, I like to think through things. Well, thank you for normalizing that. I think nowadays, especially our generation, feels pressure to have an opinion on everything, on everything, to be the first to the punch. Yes. You're very thoughtful about what you post. And even though you cover a breadth of issues, you still have a line for yourself. And I think boundaries are so important. Yeah. Within the content you create that yeah. critiques the right, mm -hmm. do you think there's room to criticize the left? Of course there's room to criticize the left. But in this moment, that's not the charge that I'm trying to lead online because that's not fundamentally where my beliefs are because I fundamentally agree with most of the principles on the left. Do I think the left has an imaging issue where people feel like it's exclusive and elitist? Like I totally think that. I think there are a lot of fine-tuned problems on the left as far as our image goes, but I agree with the principles of the left. I do not agree with the principles of the right, by and large. People always say the left eats their own because the left is so much infighting and just annihilating each other over fractional disagreements. Yeah. And it's a very easy pit to fall into, and I've fallen into it. Probably for every single person who identifies with left-wing politics, there's no singular set of beliefs that two people share entirely. But for me, the bigger picture is tackling conservatism, which I think is truly harmful to so many people. I'm not trying to stand Democrats or like praise Joe Biden, you know? Just because you're not a Republican doesn't mean I'm like, oh, praise be kumbaya. I know the principles that I agree with and the ones that I don't, and I'm trying to abide by those and, and have a conversation that feels productive by those principles. I just think it further proves the point as to why these conversations matter, right? So much can be taken out of context and a lot of the content you're creating is really just to open up more dialogue, right? And yeah. to shine a light on topics that maybe not enough people are talking about. Where do you think we can go to solve this issue of bringing people back together? And what do you see your role in that being? I think fundamentally people have to be willing to talk. And to your first question, I don't think that means engaging with someone who wants you dead because of your identity, right? There has to be lines drawn. When it comes to disagreements, if we're not willing to talk at all with people who share even maybe like more minor disagreements with us than we you know, think, then I think that's where polarization starts to really take root. For the people leaving me, like really nasty, salacious kind of comments, I have to believe that they weren't always there and someone brought them to that place 
where they felt empowered and compelled to write something like that. I think that's where we have to draw the line, right? Yeah. There are people worth engaging with. Yeah. And then there are some people that, even though we can give them as much empathy as possible, aren't even interested in dialogue. And yeah. that's sometimes what we have to weigh for ourselves. But I, I want to highlight, though, that the extremism isn't a fact of life. It's not a fact of politics. It's a product of what's been created by really polarizing extremes. It's something that I believe in my happy little Libra optimism that we can uh, get better at. I'm optimistic too. I think it's as simple as opening that echo chamber. Sometimes you'll see a comment that comes in that you disagree with, but you're like, okay, I see where that person's coming from, or I can surmise where that person's view came from. And I yeah. think we all come from some product or culmination of our experiences. Not to illuminate some more potential comments, but let's bring in some other perspectives from our Gen Z community to see some other points of view. All right, let's do it. Let's do it. So I'm gonna add you to our group text and the TC community is gonna send us some texts. I feel like guys who paint their nails or use makeup just want the attention. Like there are other ways to express yourself. First of all, I just have to say, I have no nails right now. So which unlike you. I feel shameful about, but what happened was I was at the grocery store and I uh, jammed my nail into like the, um, es like the rubber escalator railing oh. and the fake nail came off, the real nail came off. It was a bloody mess in Whole Foods and I have decided to take a break from nails for a few weeks to, oh let, to let them gosh. heal. But this does feel like a bit of a personal attack. I've been getting stuff like this from the minute I decided to express myself at all. People are gonna say, oh, it's for attention. I mean, it's beyond me that someone would assume that you expressing yourself is about them. Yeah, I think that's actually a really succinct way to put it. Um, I think that speaks more to their own discomfort with their inability to express themselves than it has anything to do with me. And I think a lot of personal attacks are a lot of times more about the person sending it than it is about me. And so I have to find kind of, like kind of solace in doing that. You know, I started painting my nails when I was like, 17. And when was the first um, time you started wearing makeup? Um, when I was like 18, when I was a senior in high school. Because of the ethos of comments like this, yeah. was it scary the first time you decided to wear makeup in public? I didn't really start wearing makeup in public until I moved to a city, um, honestly, because I didn't really feel comfortable doing it where I grew up. I would just do it in, you know, the way I learned makeup actually was I would wear it or I would um, put it on like a full face in my bedroom in my like just in the mirror uh, before bed and then I would just when I finished I would just take it off because I didn't even really want my parents to see like I was really ashamed and I think the thing is I'm not bothered by comments like this I'm not bothered by people saying it's for attention you can think whatever you want about me a comment from someone on the internet like this isn't really gonna phase the way I choose to express myself what does bother me about stuff like this though is that I remember the kid that I was and I know that there are so many out there like that who need a little bit of reassurance, who a comment like this would really prevent them, would delay them, you know, a year, two years, five years yeah. from, from feeling like they can be themselves. Only, you know, all because this person is insecure enough to think that the way they express themselves is about, you know, them. Yeah. Um, and it also sucks to hear that you felt that kind of shame, right? Like I, yeah. I hope one day that that won't occur for people maybe going through that. Right. Okay, I'll take this one. It's from Noelle Fitchett, who's a part of our community. And she wants to know, Matt, why can't we just let kids be kids? Why do we keep focusing so much on everyone's gender identity? I do want to let kids be kids. I think we all agree on letting kids be kids. But in my opinion, a lot of times on the right, what that means is let kids be the kids that I want them to be, right? let them assume the identity and the roles that I prescribe to them. Is there an age that's too young in your opinion to be talking about gender and sexuality? I think people misrepresent this conversation as like, oh, the woke left wants to talk about sex and you know, private parts and gender transition with five-year-olds, which like literally no one does, literally no one. You know, so much of this back and forth is both sides misrepresenting what the other side says. There's a big difference between talking to a five-year-old about what it means for two men to have sex and telling a five-year-old, it is okay to be yourself and be, you know, whoever you want to be as you grow up. That's the conversation that we're having. When they talk about like, you know, the kids books where it's like Henry has two moms or someone has two dads or whatever. And they're saying, why are we making it all about sex? That's not about sex. Conservatives are making that about sex. 
there's nothing inherently sexual about a gay relationship, um, about kids acknowledging and teaching kids that all relationships look different, right? Sometimes it's two men, two women. You don't have to know people's gender. And there's nothing inherently sexual or inappropriate about telling a kid that they'll be loved and accepted for who they are, which is the messaging that I'm trying to get across that a lot of people on the left are trying to get across. A lot of people on the right hide behind their own homophobia with the wording of protect children from these groomers. We're not trying to groom children. We're, we are trying truly to let kids be kids, right? We all agree, let kids be kids. If your kid is straight and cisgender and naturally aligns with traditional gender roles and he's interested in football and she's interested in dresses, live your truth, I don't care. But I wanna make an environment for kids growing up where maybe the ones who are different, you know? When people say let kids be kids, I'm like, is that actually what you're trying to do? Or are you just trying to shield them from gay people as has been the cry on the right for decades? I've never thought about this before and I think you bring up such an interesting point of view around the concept of not letting kids be exactly who they are or are meant to be is actually not letting kids be kids. Exactly. And that's something I hope more people understand because we are creating more shame and we're putting more people into boxes by trying to course correct an action that is just a young person expressing themselves. All the wording on this sounds very nice all the way around. So clearly someone is lying about what they actually wanna do. And in my opinion, it's people on the right wing going, let kids be kids. Why do they have to see a cartoon character with gay parents? That's so inappropriate. Just let kids be kids. And I'm like, you know why? Because a lot of those kids are going to grow up to be gay. They deserve to know that there is a place for them as adults. We want kids to know that there are options. That's not teaching them about sex. That's not mutilating their bodies. It's not whatever crazy shit that some people on the right cook up. That's just telling kids it's OK to be who you are. You don't have to feel shame about things that you can't change. Absolutely. And I will say in this conversation, we should maybe caution ourselves around generalizing that everyone on the right is having some hidden agenda or everyone on the left believes one way. Sure. Because I think that's also the issue is that we end up conflating a feeling that we have about even just letting kids be who they are as political, right or left. Can people stop hating on Chick-fil-A? They don't have a political agenda and they literally welcome everyone in their restaurants. They could be, this could be a hot take, but I think you can 100% separate the business owner from the business. Oh my gosh, this is like- Interesting. We can separate the art from the artist. Right. Can you separate- <laughs> Can you? Can you separate the fried chicken from the <laughs> establishment that owns it? I recently interviewed someone on the street when I was home in Wichita, and I asked them if they agreed with Chick-fil-A's policies, um, and it turned out that he worked at Chick-fil-A, and he said, well, Chick-fil-A as an establishment is welcoming of all identities. Yeah. So I thought that was an interesting perspective from someone who works there and feels that way about the business. But then when I read this and hear someone say that Chick-fil-A doesn't have a political agenda, how do you make sense of all of the donations that they've made to anti-LGBTQ causes? Right, I don't think if I walk into Chick-fil-A, they're gonna spit on me and call me a faggot. Does money going to Chick-fil-A go to some really shitty, hateful, anti-LGBTQ places. Yes. A lot of times when your money through a corporation and then another corporation and then politician and then a lobbying group goes to organizations that you fundamentally politically disagree with, there's a lot of distance between where you spend your dollar and where the money ultimately ends up going, right? Like, no ethical consumption under capitalism, something bad is always gonna end up happening with your money. I do believe that. Um, I think the thing with Chick-fil-A is that there are so many reports about the executives at Chick-fil-A are literally just funneling their money that it's very hard for some not to feel like whatever $10 they're spending on like fried chicken and a soda is, is going quite quickly. If you are choosing to eat Chick-fil-A, maybe just be aware of where that money might go. Yeah, okay. exactly. Okay, don't cancel me for this, but I don't see why it's such a big deal when people compare modern day oppression to the Holocaust. If anything, it helps make a point stronger. Um, I don't think it does make a point stronger because almost nothing is comparable to the Holocaust. In my opinion, when you immediately compare something you don't like to the Holocaust. To me, um, that's like a dog whistle for like the conversation's probably over. Just because you make a comparison to like one of the worst human atrocities of all time doesn't mean that it's an appropriate one. It probably just means that you're trying to like leverage 
the emotional appeal of comparing something to the Holocaust to make your point. We know we've reached the end of the conversation when you're calling something Hitler or when you're calling, you know, something the Holocaust, just like the Holocaust, because it's like almost definitely not. Yeah. Um, and this has happened in our community before, especially around conversations with the vaccine. Yes. And I try to help explain to people that comparing anything to the Holocaust, it dilutes the horrific nature of the Holocaust yeah. for one. And two, I think you're right. People want to make their argument stronger by tapping into that emotional appeal. But in essence, it actually doesn't help that person get their point of view across. So I've right. tried to let people know that it doesn't actually further their point of view because people will know it's immediately invalid right, because exactly. we shouldn't be comparing it. And two, it's really tricky in cases of COVID, right? Because being Jewish during the Holocaust wasn't a choice. Right. Right, where people right. can choose to get a vaccine. Right, I think it's it's two pronged. Where the one is that it's obviously extremely disrespectful to Jews, but even if you don't care about respecting Jews, it's just also the other prong, which is it's not a good argumentation tool. Right, it's just hyperbole. A lot of people, in hindsight, realize that what happened with the anti-vax protests and the anti-Semitic dog whistles was wrong and made the anti-vax movement look worse. You know, I think people, I think most people realize that now. I think most people saw that it was pretty extreme and not helpful to their cause. Um, at least so. I would hope so. At least I would hope so. So yeah. thank you for responding to those points of view. Of course. And Matt, I feel like to today I like really pieced together more of who you are and how you see the world. And of course, as you know, we're a Gen Z platform. So as we think towards this next phase of 2022 and the years ahead, what do you think is one tangible thing that a young person out there can do to try to foster these conversations and try to unify with the people around them. Like I said, just be open to conversation. I know that's like probably said a million times over, especially on this couch, but don't use disagreement as, you know, an opportunity to seclude yourself from the conversation. I'd say use it as an opportunity. I really encourage people to value their peace of mind. You don't have to engage with people who disagree with you all the time and face to face communication is one of the most valuable tools we have as far as bridging disagreement and just understanding each other as human beings and respecting each other as human beings even when we might not agree on every single thing and so I really value talking. Yeah. Me too and I'm so happy we had that type of conversation yeah. today so I think if anything it shows the value of having it yeah. and I think a lot of us are afraid nowadays with all of the issues we see and we tend to reject the idea of dialogue, but it's important to have it if and when you're ready to have it. If and when you're ready. Yeah. Matt, thank you so much for coming on POVs and just really a fan of everything you do. So can't wait to hopefully have more of these conversations in the future. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. And you know, for anyone who's not a fan of everything that I do or everything that I say, I don't expect you to be just, you know, hear me out. And that's all we can ask. Yeah. So thank you, Matt. Thank you. Breathe in. Sweet. <laughs> thank you so much. Okay. Before you go, can we take a selfie? Yeah. Okay, let's do it. Ready? One, two, three.